Good morning. My name is Evelyn Craighead, a slave, a servant of Jesus Christ. And I would like to welcome you to the Feeding House Ministries, a teaching ministry that focuses on your soul and your eternal destiny, a ministry that uncompromisingly teaches the truth of God's word. And our scripture teaching this morning comes from Ezekiel chapter 14. And I will be reading it in its entirety from the New King James Version. Now some of the elders of Israel came to me and said before me, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts, and put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. Should I let myself be inquired of at all by them? Therefore speak to them and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Every one of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity and then comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him who comes according to the multitude of his idols, that I may seize the house of Israel by their heart because they are all estranged from me by their idols. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Repent, turn away from your idols, and turn your faces away from all your abominations. For any one of the house of Israel, or of the strangers who dwell in Israel, who separates himself from me and sets up his idols in his heart, and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity, then comes to a prophet, to inquire of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. I will set my face against that man and make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prophet is induced to speak anything, I, the Lord, have induced that prophet. And I will stretch out my hand against him and destroy him from among my people Israel. And they shall bear their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be the same as the punishment of the one who inquired, that the house of Israel may no longer stray from me, nor be profound, profane any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, says the Lord God. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when a land sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it. I will cut off its supply of bread, send famine on it, and cut off man and beast from it. Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. If I cause wild beasts to pass through the land, and they empty it, and make it so desolate that no man may pass through because of the beast. Even though these three men were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters. Only they would be delivered, and the land would be desolate. Or if I bring a sword on that land, and say, sword, go through the land, and I cut off man and beast from it. Even though these three men were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters, but only the, they themselves would be delivered. Or if I send a pestilence into the land and pour out my fury on it in blood and cut off from it man and beast, even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, says the Lord, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. For thus says the Lord God, how much more it shall be when I send my four severe judgments on Jerusalem, the sword and famine and wild beast and pestilence, to cut off man and beast from it. Yet behold, there should be left in it a remnant who will be brought out, both sons and daughters. Surely they will come out to you, and you will see their ways and their doings. Then you will be comforted concerning the disaster that I have brought upon Jerusalem, all that I have brought upon it. And they will comfort you when you see their ways and their doings. And you shall know that I have done nothing without cause, that I have done in it, says the Lord God. 
This morning I would like to talk to you about idolatry and the lack of personal righteousness. This is about the certainty of God's coming judgment and the punishment of all who have idols in their hearts and all who lack personal righteousness. But most people misunderstand the meaning of idolatry and personal righteousness because they usually equate I idolatry with worshiping images of so-called gods. Mm -hmm. But in God's eyes, idolatry is far more than worshiping images. Amen. It's giving first place in our lives to anyone or anything other than God. Amen. If we devote ourselves or give our first love to anyone or anything other than God, we commit idolatry. Amen. Most people also mistakenly equate personal righteousness with good works or doing good to other people. <clears throat> they think that God accepts people who do their very best to do good works. But according <clears throat> to the word of God, our good deeds are never good enough to make us acceptable to God. Amen. And that's because we don't do good or because we don't act righteously all the time. Amen. As we walk through life, every day we come short of God's glory. We come short of his perfection. Sometimes we harbor evil thoughts. Mm -hmm. Other times we act unkindly toward people or we commit some other sinful behavior. But no matter how many good works we do, mm -hmm. we can never achieve perfect righteousness. Yes. And people who trust their own righteousness to make themselves acceptable to God will be sadly disappointed. Amen. If we stand before God claiming to be righteous, he will not accept us because God can only accept those who are perfectly righteous and only his son lived a perfectly righteous life. Amen. Therefore, the only righteousness that's acceptable to God is the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. Yes. This is the reason we must trust Christ, casting ourselves upon him and pleading with God to accept us based on the righteousness of his son. And God gives Ezekiel a very special message, one that exposes the idolatry of the Israelites' hearts and their false trust in their own personal righteousness. This is the certainty of God's coming judgment, the punishment of all who have idols in their hearts and all who lack personal righteousness. And God pronounced his judgment on all who had idols in their hearts. Keep in mind now that an idol is anyone or anything that takes God's place in our life. Mm -hmm. And God must have first place. Amen. When you put anything else first, mm -hmm. whether it's you, your family, your business, your possessions, your wealth, or anything else, you commit idolatry. Amen. Whatever has first place in your life is your idol, and that idol claims your greatest affection and interest. And God warned the Jewish in exiles as he warns us that his hand of judgment would fall on all who have idols in their hearts. And some of the leaders of the Jews had vid visited the prophet Ezekiel to seek his counsel. Apparently they were disturbed about his prediction that Jerusalem and Judah would be utterly destroyed. After all, many of the exiles believed that they would soon be returning to their homeland. But if Judah were destroyed, there would be no homeland to return to. Mm -hmm. And the prophet's message was discouraging the people, crushing the hope that many of them cherished in their hearts. Furthermore, the people were having difficulty believing that God would destroy them totally. After all, the Lord had appointed them to be his chosen people, to be the recipients of his holy word, to be the channel to which the Messiah would come, to be his witnesses to the world that he was the only living and true God, yeah. and to be the people among whom he would manifest his presence in his temple. Because of these special blessings from the Lord, mm. many of the Jewish people refused to believe that God would utterly destroy their nation. And yet the Babylonians had already invaded Judah twice. And on both occasions they had deported a large number of Jews. Mm. But they had never totally destroyed Jerusalem, nor had they deported all the survivors. To the Jews this seemed to indicate that God would never allow Israel to be utterly destroyed. But Ezekiel's preaching not only contradicted this belief, 
but it also crushed the people's mm. hope that they would soon return to their homeland. Thus the Jewish leaders visited Ezekiel to seek clarification from the Lord. And while they were seated together in Ezekiel's home, the Lord gave his prophet this present message. God issued a strong indictment to all who were double-minded and to all who had a half-hearted commitment to him. Mm. And most of the people were claiming to seek and worship the Lord, but at the same time they were worshiping idols in their hearts. Although they professed to be followers of the Lord, their hearts were set on the pleasures, riches, and the so-called gods of Babylon where they now lived. And setting their affection on the things of this world, their commitment to the Lord was only half-hearted. They didn't give God his rightful place in their lives. They didn't give God first place. Mm -hmm. Instead, they set up idols in their hearts, and in so doing, they created the very stumbling block that would cause their downfall. And God issued a strong warning to all who were double-minded, all who were only half-heartedly committed to him. The Lord would allow idolaters to live as they chose. Mm -hmm. He would give them over to false worship and to the lust of their flesh. And since they had set their hearts on the false gods of this world, the Lord would allow them to worship their idols and to waddle around in their fleshly pursuits. Mm. God will not violate people's free will by yeah. forcing them to obey his commandments and live righteously. Amen. And God isn't interested in having the worship of robots. He wants people to freely choose to love and worship him. Yes. Thus, if people choose to disobey God's holy commandments, if they choose to set up idols in their hearts, and God gives them over to the lust of this world, the Lord will allow them to live as they choose. Yes. And God clearly states his purpose for allowing people to live as they choose, and his purpose is to turn their hearts and minds back to him. Amen. The Lord has made the human heart to sense the repugnance, the dislike, the hatred, the disgust, and emptiness of sin. When he allows people to live according to fleshly lust and to engage in false worship, some of them will feel a deep emptiness in their soul and become disgusted with their lifestyle. Yes. This will stir them up to repent. It will move them to turn from their idols back to the Lord. And a sick, empty feeling will drive some people to seek the Lord and cry out to him. Yeah. As a result, God will be able to capture the hearts of a few of them. Mm. So again, the Lord seeks to turn the hearts of some people back to him. Therefore, he allows people to live as they choose. If they choose to worship false gods, he will give them over to their lust. Yeah. Romans chapter 1 verses 24 to 32 says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, and the lust of their hearts to honor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, unconcerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. God pronounced judgment on all who refused to repent. Yeah. And his judgment would fall on all who rejected him mm -hmm. and continued to worship idols in their hearts. They would be given over to their idolatry. 
and would be allowed to suffer the nauseousness and emptiness of sin and false worship. God would make unrepentant people examples of sin's consequences. He would also cut them off from his people, never allowing them to become members of his family, and neither would he give them an inheritance in the promised land. Mm. But the unrepentant people weren't the only ones who would face God's judgment. False prophets would also give an account for the untrue messages they had preached. Amen. They would face God's hand of judgment, and he would cut them off from true believers. James chapter 4 verse 8 says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The point to see is that the Lord allowed the prophets to exercise free will in their preaching ministry. Mm -hmm. If they chose to deliver messages that made people feel good about themselves, but neglected the consequences of sin and the coming judgment, the Lord would allow them to do as they wished. But the false prophets would bear the guilt of their terrible sin. Mm -hmm. They would face God's coming yes. judgment. Revelation chapter 3 verses 15 through 16 says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. God's judgment of unrepentant idolaters and false prophets had a threefold purpose. The people would no longer stray from the Lord. Mm -hmm. The people would no longer defile themselves with sin. Yeah. And the people would be the Lord's possession and he would be their God. Amen. And I want you to think about this because idolatry is a terrible sin against God. Mm -hmm. God has given us the great gift of life with all its wonderful blessings. He encourages us to love not only ourselves but also our families and everyone else. But God demands that we love him more than anyone or anything else. Amen. Matthew 6 verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one, the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. If we give our greatest love and devotion to anything or anyone other than God, we commit adultery, Amen. and it's easy to recognize what's first in our life. It's whatever has our primary allegiance. It's whatever receives most of our devotion. It's whoever we love the most, and it's whoever receives most of our affection. When a person or a thing has first place in our life, we are primarily committed to that person or thing. Mm -hmm. Thus, we've set up an idol in our own heart. Yes. James chapter 1 verse 8 says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We are all guilty of idolatry. We are guilty of being double-minded, and we are guilty of having a half-hearted commitment to God. But God will never accept second place. He rejects all half-hearted yes. commitments, and he demands that we put him first in our yes. lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21 says, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. God pronounced his judgment on all who lacked personal righteousness. Remember, some of the Jewish leaders had visited Ezekiel to discuss his preaching. Because they were concerned that the prophet focused so much on judgment that he was even predicting that Jerusalem would be utterly destroyed. In response, Ezekiel challenged the leaders and the people to repent. And apparently his challenge reminded the leaders about Abraham's prayer for Sodom and Gomorrah and God's wonderful promise to spare the city if ten righteous people could be found in it. And since the Lord had been willing to save two cities known for their horrible wickedness, surely he would turn his judgment away from Jerusalem for the sake of the righteousness that were living there, even if their number was small. And knowing the leader's thoughts, the Lord gave Ezekiel a clear message for them. The few righteous people living in Jerusalem would not stop his hand of judgment from falling. God is holy and just, even as he is loving and merciful. Therefore, he must ensure justice and execute judgment among the people. And all people and nations must give an account to God for their own behavior. Amen. In the day of judgment, 
all unrighteous people and nations will face God's condemnation. Yes. Just as God will shower the righteous with his loving mercy, he will pour out his holy judgment on all unrighteousness. And to illustrate this point, the Lord instructed Ezekiel to present four scenarios of judgment. But a point to notice is that Jerusalem itself isn't identified. Instead, a generic term like the land or a country is used. This suggests that this passage of scripture is applicable to all nations and all people. Right. Thus all people and nations must give an account to God for their behavior, whether it has been righteous or wicked. And surely scripture clearly shows the four case argument for the coming judgment and the absolute necessity for righteousness. The first case involves people who sin so much that they arouse God to strike the land with a severe famine. In this case, God totally cuts off the nation's food supply and both people and animals starve. Mm. When the people of a nation sin enough to cause God's hand of judgment to fall with such severity, even the most righteous people in society won't be able to save them. Even if Noah, Daniel, and Job all live there, their righteousness couldn't stop God's hand of judgment from falling on the wicked. Mm -hmm. And in light of just how righteous these three men were, this is a startling statement because Noah trusted God and lived so righteously that God delivered him from the flood. Daniel trusted God and lived so righteously that God delivered him from the lion's den. Yes. Job trusted the Lord and lived so righteously that God delivered him through some of the most horrible sufferings imaginable. Although these three men truly trusted and lived for the Lord, their faith and righteousness could save only themselves. Mm. They couldn't save anyone else. Amen. Even if they were living today, their strong faith and righteousness couldn't save anyone else. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Every person has to give an account to God for his or her own behavior, whether good or bad. The second case involves the people who sin so much that, God, that they arouse God to send an invasion of wild animals to devastate the land by killing all the people, even the children. In this case, not even a person as righteous as Noah, Daniel, or Job to save their own sons or daughters. Mm. Only the righteous themselves will be saved. The land and its wicked citizens will still suffer God's hand of judgment. The third case involves a people who sin so much that they arouse God to judge the land through war. Mm. Again, when God judges the wicked, the presence of the righteous will not stop his hand of judgment from falling. Amen. This is why innocent people die in war. Even if the faith of the righteous is as strong as that of Noah, Daniel, or Job, they couldn't be able to save anyone else, not even their own children. Only the righteous themselves will be saved. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The fourth case involves a people who sin so much that they arouse God to send a plague, an epidemic of disease throughout the land. Think about COVID. Mm. Once again, when God begins to execute judgment, even those as righteous as Noah, Dan, and Job will not be able to save anyone other than themselves, not even their own children. God will credit their righteousness only to themselves. Yeah. In concluding his argument, Ezekiel applied the four cases to the current situation in Jerusalem. And since the present generation was so wicked, they could expect nothing but the se severest of judgment. The Lord clearly said that he would send these four terrifying judgments against Jerusalem. The sword, family, famine, wild animals, and plague. Mm -hmm. When Babylon invaded the land, the sword of war would strike. And when the siege was set up, Around Jerusalem, both famine and disease were spread among the people who had sought refuge behind the walls of the great city. By the time the city fell, the country would be completely devastated and wild animals would take over the uninhabited land. Mm. And once God's judgment fell upon the land, 
the Lord's name and his word would be vindicated. And the people who survived the war would be deported and scattered throughout the Babylonian Empire. At that time, the exiles who were already in Babylon would understand how wicked the citizens of Jerusalem had really been. This would help ease the sorrow that the early exiles were feeling due to the destruction of their homeland. They would understand why God had, had to execute judgment against Jerusalem and its citizens. And they would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God had been perfectly justified in destroying Jerusalem. Yeah. And the citizens deserve God's judgment because of their horrible wickedness. And think about this. When we stand before God, we must face him all alone. Because each of us is responsible for our own behavior. Yes. And righteousness can't be inherited. Amen. As much as godly mothers and fathers may want to pass down righteousness to their children, they can't. Each person must individually trust Christ for their own righteousness. Because whatever righteousness we have is flawed. Romans chapter 3 verses 23 to 25 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because of his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Despite our best intentions, we sin through evil thoughts and behavior, and that makes us totally unacceptable to God. Yes. But to become acceptable to God, we must trust the perfection and righteousness of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Because the righteousness of Christ is the only righteousness that the Father will accept. When we truly trust Christ, God credits the righteousness of Christ to us. Amen. As believers, our faith in Christ is counted as righteousness. Yeah. If we truly turn our lives over to Christ... Trusting him with all our hearts, mm -hmm. God accepts us in the righteousness of Christ. Amen. It's his righteousness and his shed blood on the cross that makes us acceptable to God. So make sure you have no idols in your heart and that you are not lacking in your own personal righteousness. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Our dear, precious, and heavenly Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word today, Father God. We thank you that you would love us so much that you would have us searching our own hearts to see if we are, have idols in our heart and that we lack any personal righteousness. Help us to be all that you have purposed us to be. But most of all, Lord, help us to remember that we can only be righteous when we accept your son, Jesus. Because... When he died, when he was crucified, when he was buried, and when he rose, he took our sin and gave us his righteousness. Thank you. If we, he was still in the grave, we would have no hope. But we have hope, Father God, because of what your son Jesus has done for us. He gave his life for us to have life. And all he asks us to do is just to keep him first in our lives. Thank you for your word. And for each hearer, let their hearts be softened to receive this truth. In Jesus' name, amen.